So welcome to the practical class in discrete math. We're again going to be on Zoom online and also in the class here in Moscow. Uh, I hope that the whiteboard will be okay. Um, since we're also calling some people from the class here, we cannot use any other sort of online you know, whiteboards. Um, so the markers should be nice. And uh, uh, today we'll, uh, as usual, we'll uh, discuss uh, the uh, previous uh, homeworks and uh, then we'll uh, go to the new exercise sheet. So uh, for the new one, I will ask, I will ask the people to take it. So please take it here and also I will post uh, the link to the chat. It is available on the course's webpage um, as the following assignment, which is called polynomial computations. So it is here. And, uh, but before we start, we'll discuss the old one, which is Turing machines and graphs. And the most interesting will be the task on graphs. So um, let me wait a bit for the people coming to the class here. So with the lack of exercise sheets, there are also others here. I will take one for me only. And uh, we're about to start. Yeah, let's start. So for the assignment on graphs, let us discuss uh, exercise number five. So maybe someone of you wants to, yeah, let, let me first uh, notice that here we consider only uh, graphs without parallel edges and uh, loops. So it's not a multigraph, just a usual graph. And uh, let's see, for example, 5a. I think we did it last time. The formulation is as follows. There is a graph, nine vertices of degree three, 11 vertices of degree four, and 10 vertices of degree five. So if we try to do this, uh, the usual um, situation is as follows. We try to compute the number of edges, and then we know the number of edges is um, two multiplied by the sum of degrees. So now the sum of degrees in 5a is going to be nine multiplied by 3 plus 11 multiplied by 4 plus 10 multiplied by 5. And oops, this number is odd. So how did I guess that? Well, this is even, this is even, and this is odd. So a sum of odd plus even plus even is always odd. So this is odd. But if the graph existed, this should would have been a, an even number because the Mm, it is just the uh, number of edges multiplied by two. So since this is odd, we immediately fail. So just take this. Um, okay. So now let's take two b. So there are two vertices. Two vertices of degree three and three of degree two. So how do you think? What is the answer? It exists. It exists. Can you draw it? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, that's exactly what we need. So, um, by the way, this graph is called a bipartite graph. What does it mean to be bipartite? It means that its vertices are separated into two parts. So this is one part and this is the other part. And all edges come just between parts. So bipartite graphs are important in computer science because they represent uh, relations between objects. So for example, if you have, mm, I don't know, if you have some objects and some properties, they the correspondence between them is a bipartite graph. So here are objects and properties. The standard, I don't know, toy examples are like, I don't know, marriage problems and stuff like that. So, and uh, when you do this, or any sorts of um, uh, correspondences, like person um, bought a ticket for a plane, so there's the flight, these are the passengers, stuff like that. What is the good thing about bipartite graphs, and we will see this in today's class, that uh, for bipartite graphs, many problems which are hard, for example, and be complete in general, they could be easily solved. And uh, this is one example of how we use the theory of NP completeness. So if we see a problem which is NP complete, we understand this problem as being hard. We try to find easier subproblems which can be solved attractively. And for graphs, usually if your problem is hard, then check whether you really need all graphs. Maybe you need only bipartite graphs for which your problem is going to be easy. So this is what happens. So, okay. For 2B, the answer is yes, and now a 2C. So there is one vertex of degree uh, 1, 2 of degree 2, and uh, 1 of degree 3, and 2 of degree 5. So does such a graph exist? Remember, it's not a, a multigraph, it's just a graph. No. No, quite. Uh, uh, there are two vertices of degree y and six vertices in general. So those vertices are connected to all the others, but because there is one vertex, yeah, degree one. Exactly. So let me repeat that. Uh, here, well, first, if we check it like that, we'll get an even number. Just believe me, I won't do this, but uh, the, crit the criteria based on the uh, evenness of the sum doesn't work here. It's even, but this doesn't mean that the graph exists. Actually, a multigraph like that exists. You could try, try to find it out, but a real, the usual graph does not exist. Why? Well, uh, let's see. So the total number of vertices is six. It's two plus two plus. Here I have vertices of degree five. Uh, a vertex of degree five in a not a multigraph, we don't have parallel edges, it should be connected to all other vertices. So we have these six vertices. And this is the vertex of degree five, and therefore it should be connected to anything else. It cannot be connected to itself, and it could be connected, it could not be connected twice to any other vertex. So it should be connected exactly once to any other vertex. And also there is another vertex of degree five. I suppose it's somewhere here. Oh, it doesn't matter where it is because uh, they're all symmetric. So it's also connected to all other vertices. So these edges should exist in the graph, and this means that the degree of each of these vertices is at least two. We already have two two edges which should be drawn there. Maybe more. I don't claim that there could be other edges also. It should, should be because there is degree three, for example, here. But this is a contradiction with this claim. That there is no vertex of degree one. So therefore, this graph does not exist. It could be implemented as a multigraph. This is an exercise for you. So the idea is that this is not a, a criteria. This is only a one way theorem that if your graph exists, then this sum should be even. But if it is even, then the graph could be inexistent due to other problems. So now an Euler path. 
So, um, okay, the, actually, 6A it, it, it was a mistaken one. It's only for multigraphs. Because in 6A, it should be fixed in the next edition of the course. So, in 6A, what do you have in 6A? You will have three of degree three and uh, one of degree five. Oops, you immediately failed because there could not be a vertex of degree five if you have only four vertices. But suppose that you are allowed to do multigraphs. Could such a graph exist? Yes, yes it could, yeah, but actually it is the curly curly graph. But in the Königsberg graph, there is no Euler cycle, right? No, no Euler cycle in such a graph, right? But could such a multigraph exist and have an Euler cycle? Maybe another graph also. No. Why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so in, if you have an Euler path in a graph or multigraph, so in the, no, with, you can talk about other paths, multigraphs are okay, and also loops are okay. But yeah, a loop gives you two to the degree, because two edges come. So if you want an Euler path, uh, the path uh, starts at some vertex, so this is A, then it goes somehow along the graph, and then it reaches some vertex B. There are two possibilities. Either A and B are the same, and then it's an other cycle, or they are different, and this is an other path, not, not non cyclic one. So these are the only two vertices which could be odd. Actually, the path could, it could go like that also. It could return to a vertex on the path. But here you see that this is degree one, for example. Here the degree is three. So we came to B, we did another path, and we returned to B. But any other vertex here, for example, C, would have an even degree. Here it's four. Because uh, for each entering edge, you will have an exiting edge. And this should happen because otherwise you will not make your path. And each, recall that it's an other path. So each edge should be used exactly once. And therefore, for each intermediate vertex, the entrance and the exit, so the number of uh, entrances should be the same as the number of exits. So that it should be even. Otherwise, we get stuck in the system. And this will not be the intermediate one. So the number of vertices of degree of odd degree should be less or equal than two. Now, it could be zero if the, there is the situation of the cycle. It could be two if it is a path. Could it be one? No, it couldn't, because then the sum will be odd. There will be many, even if it's only one odd vertex will make the sum of degrees odd, and this is impossible in any graph, in any multiple. So it's either zero or two. So uh, the question is, we'll discuss it today, whether this is a criterion, but at least it is a necessary condition that if you're, you have more odd vertices, you fail. So here all the vertices are odd, they're more than two, therefore, there is no Euler path and no Euler cycle. So um, now let's see uh, point B. So uh, six point B. Here there are um, two vertices of degree one. This is okay. Uh, there are ten vertices of degree four, and there are seven vertices of degree six. So, well, how could one imagine such a graph at first? But uh, the question is even harder. Does any graph of this sort have an Euler path? Not cycle. So cycle is impossible because we have two vertices of degree one. So this should be the start of the end. But does such a graph always have an Euler path or cycle? 
Yes, yes. This is exactly the word I wanted to hear. So uh, there, there is one more obstacle for an oil and path to exist. So the first obstacle is the number of odd vertices. If you have many odd vertices greater than two, say four or bigger, then you don't have an oil and path, right? But uh, if you all say, if, even if all your vertices are even, you could fail to have an oil and path because your graph could be disconnected. It could be really a bunch of several graphs. Let's see here. So what is seven vertices of degree six? Well, seven vertices of degree six can be realized as just what they call a complete graph on six vertices. No, no, on, I'm sorry, on three so we have that one. So this is K7. This is a graph on seven vertices and each is connected to each other. So this is that. Inside this graph, you will have an Euler cycle, by the way, but uh, it doesn't matter for us. So now 10 vertices of degree four, how can you do this? Well, it could be K5 and another K5. So K5 is a pentagon with a pentagram inside. This is each has degree four and there are five of them. Another one. So here are 10 vertices, all of them are degree four. And two vertices of degree one can just uh, make the. This is, by the way, K2, a complete graph of two vertices. So this graph is disconnected, it has only two odd vertices. But what is the <laughs> proposed Euler path? It should start here and then here. So it just traverses this edge, but it could not reach other edges. And the graph is disconnected. You don't have a path, even not Euler path. You don't have a path which visits all these components. So therefore, this graph does not have an Euler path, while it uh, satisfies the criteria. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but the, what, what was the question? The question is, will a graph with the following degrees always have an Euler path? So this is a counter example. Therefore, if we asked for, does there exist such a graph, then we had to invent a graph which has an Euler path. In this case, I believe it's also possible, but uh, it's not the question we were asking. We could make it connected in, in some way try to modify these components and connect them. It, it could be made connected because there are many edges. So the graph is disconnected if it has a very small number of edges. Here edges and many edges, so it should be doable, but uh, this is a counter example to our question. Okay, and uh, so there, um, uh, real question is now we have two obstacles against having an Euler path or cycle. So, well, before going further, let me uh, make a small note, note just to, for make, to make things easier. Um, if we know how to construct Euler cycles, we know how to construct Euler paths. The Euler path problem is easily reducible to the Euler cycle one just by the following trick. As you know, if you have an Euler path, then you have only two odd vertices. Let's uh, just take these two odd vertices and just let's connect them by an extra black edge. Then the existence of an Euler cycle in this new graph is equivalent to the existence of an Euler path with these two ends in the original graph. So therefore, we can always talk about cycles. Paths, Euler paths are reduce, reducible to Euler cycles by this trick. This is the first thing which I wanted to remind. The second thing is that we have two obstacles against an Euler cycle. The first one is odd vertices. If you have an Euler cycle, you're not allowed to have any odd vertices. All vertices should be even. The second problem is disconnectedness. If your graph is disconnected, you also fail. Okay, are there any other obstacles? How do you think? So suppose your graph is connected, all vertices are even. Should this graph have an Euler cycle? Mm -hmm. 
So let's think of this uh, just sometime while we discuss other problems in our sheets. But this is an important question. So how to, if, if yes, then we immediately get an algorithm for a decision problem for Euler's effect. Okay, so let's think about it. And now let's see problem seven. So does anyone want to write a Hamiltonian cycle? To draw? While you are thinking, I will draw the, uh, the graph. So by the way, this graph is famous. It's a graph of a dodecahedron. Unfortunately, I didn't take a physical dodecahedron here. So it's one of the uh, Platonian solids, one of the, uh, okay, there's something in the chat. Okay, so something just says yes. Okay, um, someone says yes. So yeah, the dodecahedron is one of these uh, regular polytopes of the uh, Platonian solid, which are regular figures, but here it's flattened on the plane. So really, usually it is physical body. Um, in, 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 if it is 3D, then all these uh, its um, faces are actually equal. So these are regular net pentagons. But here it's flat. So we'll have this big pentagon outside. So inside you will have, for each of these, you will get something like that. So next you will have also intermediate vertices here, and you will have these pentagons here. And also you will have one here again. And next you will have a small pentagon inside. Or it should be, no, no, actually it should be just, just, just here. So it should be here, 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 and this is blocked as a pentagon. And for this graph, we, uh, yeah, uh, the theory is that any Platonian solid has an a Hamiltonian path. So that it doesn't have an Euler path, of course, because all the vertices are odd, they have degree three, but it has a Hamiltonian path. So does anyone want to draw it? The Hamiltonian path should pass each vertex one time, please. Take a marker of a, an alternative color. The only alternative color for sure is here in black. Okay, and draw the. Start traversing the eternal pentagon, then you go inside, you traverse this long line inside. This is not a unique solution, so I don't know whether it will win, but it looks like it will win. Well, yeah, yeah. This is already passed, yeah, so you return. Yeah, and you go where it was, yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is a solution. Thank you. So um, this finishes the first task on the graphs. So also in the first exercise sheet we had uh, several tedious questions about Turing machine. I'm asked the, asking the auditorium, both on Zoom and uh, in class, whether we should discuss them. I don't want to discuss all of them, but they should be just easy exercises. If uh, you have any questions about them, please ask now or forget about them. If not, then we'll go further. And uh, while we were talking about uh, oil and paths, Let's continue. So the question is whether 
Mm -hmm. On the chat. So the question, sorry, the question is the chat. So um, we are asking for people that are asking for the number two. Okay, so we had to do number two. Uh, let's try, I don't know, let's try 2C as a, as a harder one. And then maybe we'll, it will be easy how to, if we, we know how to do 2B, you also know how to do 2A, let's do 2C. We had to do this, 2C from the previous class. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. So the language which we want to to um, make polynomial is uh, the following: zero, zero, zero k times, then one, one k times, and zero, zero k times. I'll try to do it by myself just to make things faster. Um, so how to do that? Well, zero zeros ones, uh, zero 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 zero. K is our parameter. Well, the parameter is formally speaking three K, but its polynomiality is the same as for being as K is parameter. And we need to find a Turing machine to do this to solve whether and then so this we have to decide whether the given word in the alphabet of zeros and ones belongs to this language. So how do we check? So uh, we'll have this form of notation. So if our machine reaches the final state QF, we say that this is, uh, yes, this is winning. If it fails, we'll just make, it will just fail to compute. It will just come on a configuration where it has no more. Just this easier thing. We could rewrite it just for answering literally no, but it's just easier to do it with fail. So, okay, we start with zeros. Uh, and now we have to, well, what we really have to do? We have to uh, somehow remember these numbers. And the only way to remember it is to put some marks in front of them. So, uh, what is the idea? The idea is that um, you first have to check that this length is the cell. So, we, we here we're now going to go blank. Let's go ahead and be. So here's the blank, blank. Here is also blank. And uh, the idea is to first calculate that this block is the same as this one. Then we calculate that this block is the same as this one. So in order to do that, we um, first we start the state Q0. We have to be at zero. So we start with Q0 starting here. If it is not zero, we immediately fail. We do not have an instruction for that. This means that the word is not of the given. So it should be K greater or equal than one. So the K, this one zero should exist here. And now what should we do? We should, what? Yeah, we're going right, but I wish to mark this zero with something else. So I will do the following. I will go into state Q1, make the zero some zero prime. Of course, we can we can ruin our data. It's it's not like I thought we can only have one only number. No, no, it's an internal alphabet. We have an internal alphabet signal. We can use anything. If uh, you want just on zero on zeros and ones, you can recode your machine using bytes and stuff like that. So then the first have to add the recorder, and then this, is, this will be hard. For the internal alphabet is sigma, it includes 0, 1, b, and uh, any cell for one. Any final cell. 0 prime, and we'll go to the right. What happens next? So now q1 with 0 just goes to the right. And uh, what happens next? Next, we come to um, the one. So Q1 with the unit. What will happen now? Well, um, again, let's do the following. Let's go here. Let's go to this one. So we go again with Q1 with one to the right. And now if you Q1 and you reach zero, so if you reach B here, you just immediately fail. It's bad situation. Um, so um, 
you could, by the way, we could do the following. So we could, uh, yeah, q1 and 0. So you go to the right. Actually, we know what we're going to be q1 and 0. So we go, we go up to here, up to here, actually. So what happens when we do q1 and b? So when we do q1 and b, we have to return and to some state q2 with the same b and left. So now we're here in the state q2. Now we again replace our with a zero prime. Now with our zero prime, now with our zeros, we return to here. So it's again Q three zero L. Now Q three with the one is going to come to Q four one prime L. Q41 goes back to Q41 um, L. And now Q4, um, yeah, so let's do it like this. Um, Q4 with zero also goes for q4 0 l so now this first one is 0 prime and we have returned to here um, in the state q4 so now what should we do next so in the state the camera didn't capture all that though. Let me try to do this. If now it should capture. Now it should capture. Yeah. Okay. So now we are in the state Q4 here. Once we've reached zero prime, we rewrite it as a zero. We rewrite it as zero prime. Move right and move to Q0. So now we have to add one more thing. We have to add Q. So now Q0 will rewrite it into the next zero prime. This will be replaced by zero prime. And next you will go and get into Q1, which should go to the right and Q1 in the state if it observes one prime, it should just keep it up. Okay, so again in the state q1 we go go go. Next we reach zero prime. So here q1 with zero prime should do the same with the blank. It should move to q2 zero prime left. So um, okay, and uh, we move again to the left. So now we have Q3. And now Q3 should change the unit to one. But also there could be one primes happening here. So Q2 with the one prime just to there's some call in the telephone. It should just go to the left using Q2. So this is the Q2. So what happens next? So here we have two zero primes. Here in this, so we have moved here. So here you will have also zero prime, zero prime. Here we have one prime, prime. And again, you return here and you eat up all these zeros. So now what happens? So um, now if uh, there could be several situations of failure. Uh, if uh, there are uh, more than um, three blocks, so for example, it could be the other zeros there, then it would uh, fail to do the state change. It would run in the state Q4, it would reach some zeros inside, and will say it's bad. The same happens if there are no ones, if there are only zeros. 
But again, it will fail to change the state here. Right? So this all designed only to work on uh, words of the form 000. zero, zero. Um, yeah, it should be like this. I will get so this will work only on uh, zero, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, zero. Otherwise, it will fail to perform this, even the first run. Uh, then when it um, what could happen next suppose that uh, in one of these blocks the number of uh, elements is less than here then again when it starts from q0 at one of the zeros here it will try to go forward but when it goes backward it will fail to perform either this transition or this transition because it should, uh, if it if it renamed one of these zeros into zero prime, after that it should go perform a run and, and rename one of the zeros here into zero and one of the ones here into one and zero prime and one prime remains. Okay, so this means that if we say that this is k one, k two, k three, then our uh, the fact that we didn't fail by now guarantees the following, that the word is of this form, otherwise it will fail to make even the first run. And also we are guaranteed that k2 is greater or equal than k1 and k3 is greater than k2. We wish them to be equal. But what will happen next? So what happens when we uh, reach the, um, when we reach the zero here? So, uh, we, we have uh, exhausted all these key ones. So we replace the last zero with uh, zero prime. What happens next? We start our run, it goes forward and backward. And it uh, returns to this zero prime in the state Q4, right? So this zero prime is, uh, it returns to zero prime in the state of Q4. Once it happens, we return here using this rule. Where is it? Yes, we return here to, to go to the right. So it returns here in the state Q0. And now we are in this um, weird situation where Q0 sees not a zero but something else. What could it see? If it sees one, it's a bad situation because this means that there are more units here than zeros here. So therefore, for Q0 and 1, we should not introduce any instructions because this means that this should fail. But what should appear here? One, one prime. So if we have Q0 with the one prime, uh, this should be a good, um, uh, a good rule. And this could not happen in the beginning because our external alphabet does not include one prime. One prime is only a letter of our internal alphabet used inside our computation. And now, what happens next? Q0 and 1 prime give us the following. They give us, um, now, well, we are not finished yet. Because if we are in the state Q0, observing 1 prime, this guarantees us here that, uh, so in this place, it guarantees that K2 is equal to K1. But still, um, the, this stuff could be different. So if we're in state Q0 and observing one prime, we should move to some state, I don't know, Q5, and say no move. So we have just changed our state in order to start the checking. So now what should we check? How do you think? What? Whether there, there is a zero for yeah, there's zero, yeah. So no, for even even just for bare zero. If all of them are zero with the uh what is it in English with the apostrophe, Kreska, then uh it's okay if there is a naked zero here, then this is bad. Yeah, what does it mean of zero one prime and zero prime? We have introduced new letters into our alphabet. So our alphabet included 0, 1, and b. Inside the internal alphabet, we're allowed to use other letters which are 
which we introduced to the zero prime and one prime. So, just to come back. so in this stage two five, we are just if we observe one prime, we just move right and do nothing with this one prime. And next, if we are in state q5 and we observe zero prime, this means we reach this place, and in this place we know that k3 also equals k1. That we have exhausted at this, the, we have uh, simultaneously exhausted uh, zeros, ones, and zeros. And this will yield us, oh, I write qf, the final state. Which is the success of the of our algorithm? Well, then I can write something like zero prime. No, just do nothing with the. Okay. And the last zero again. So what what happened? Yeah. So we have reached this, yeah. and we are in state q zero, yeah. and we have observed one prime. Mm -hmm. This means that k two equals k one. That we have exhausted these zeros and these ones simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So we have reached half of our goal. We have reached equivalence of these two blocks. So what should yeah now we are, what should we check now we should check that this block what well, we know that is greater or equal we should check that it's really the same it's not greater this means that the first letter here should be not zero but zero prime we have renamed it in a coordinated way what should we do then we, we should reach this place and look at this for this i change to a special state called q5 if this is state q5 i just drag along this uh, block in the middle it's all of one primes mm -hmm. if something else happened it's some weird failure we just had and then we reach this place and we should find q zero prime here if we find there a zero but not a zero prime or a blank or something else then this means that we fail but if uh, we find a good zero prime then we change our state to q final and q final by our agreement is the success situation so we say that this is success. So if we reach Q5, yep. Yeah. And now, well, this is all for <laughs> the uh, Turing machine. I hope I didn't miss anything. There could be uh, small missings, like I forgot something. But uh, in, in general, the idea is as follows. The workflow is as follows. But now also, the question was that uh, the problem is in B. So now we had to compute accurately the number of moves which the machine takes when it runs on, for example, when it runs on a good example, well, on a bad, it will. So what we can say that if our example is bad, then the machine uh, takes less operations to find out the failure. It stops at some point and says, okay, no more moves available. So let's think about a successful run. So there is only one parameter called K. Well, let K be the maximum of K1, K2, and K3. Because we don't know that K is the same, but so how many moves should it take? So um, it takes K moves. Um, so for each renaming of zero here, it takes, uh, yeah. What does it mean, N? I don't have any N here. Come on. And ah, N, N here, yeah. N means no move, it means not move left, not move right. Okay, so uh, it takes um, for each element from here, we rename it into zero or zero prime. It takes, uh, well, roughly speaking, the following number of moves two, k1 plus k2 plus k3. Well, less or equal, right? Because, um, well, uh, if you go so this is the time, time estimation. Um, why do, should, should this happen? Mm, well, because, so, and this will be multiplied by Q1. So why should this happen? Well, because um, uh, for each, we take this, well, some of them could be already removed, but when we take this, we go forward, 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 we reach this and go backwards. Well, let me add, I don't know, some constant, I don't know, like three. Maybe this is for some things at the edges when we do renaming stuff like that. So this means that for each zero from here, we perform this number of steps plus 
we must have a key one. And also plus, once we have reached here, here we also have to perform all these steps, well, which will be roughly something like K2, well, plus something. What is something? It's this guy and this guy, which is not perform any move. It's plus, plus two, well, let's do it plus five. It's a rough estimation, all these constants don't matter. And of course, this is quadratic with respect to this input size, K1 plus K2. So indeed it's polynomial of a real input size K1 plus K2. So this is how we formally prove polynomiality of a decision problem. Of course, this is the thing we never do because you see that this is an easy language. Programming this in a real computer is trivial. Programming it in a Turing machine is that sort of hard. But you can see that anything which can be programmable on a computer can be also translated into Turing machine. And the polynomiality will get cancelled. So here we, uh, of course, we get quadratic length. If we try to implement it on a random access machine, then it will, of course, be something like linear because, well, you could, even if you have three tapes, you could just run three heads and just compute. Here we use this quadratic time in order to go forward, back, or forward, back. But polynomiality is kept. So it's still polynomial in time. And of course, in memory. So in memory, it's constant. It's, well, it's linear. It's, it doesn't use any more memory than we. Uh, well, the only thing it uses extra is this extra blank stuff, which is used for checking for the end of the work. OK, so this is to be. Great. So I hope that we will not ask you to do three or four. If yes, I will do it next class, just because we have to go for half an hour left and we have to do something like that. Okay, so uh, there are also two questions in the new exercise sheet concerning um, Turing machines. So I think that the first one, yeah, so this, I think, let's think, look at the second one. This is about a two tape Turing machine. I don't remember, did we do that at some point during the lecture of the class? Oh, yes. uh, B? Uh, no, the new, new ah. inside sheet uh, number two. Okay, we could go. Yeah, we do wish to do this more accurately. Okay, let's do it. So it's um, Okay, so modeling a two tape Turing machine on a one tape Turing machine. So what is the real uh, trick here? Um, let's see a bit. Just um, so you have two tapes. Sorry, it's a bad one. So we have one tape which includes symbols A1, AN, and the second which includes B1, DN. Well, really they go, 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 go forward. And I think that, uh, yeah, so um, now we are going to introduce a new, um, yeah, it could be both, interest in both directions, by the way. So now we could introduce a new um, composite symbol. How do we do that? Well, in the Turing machine, somehow here we have this first tape with this letter P. Somewhere here we have the second tape with the letter Q. And the, actually, of course, how do we model the two tapes in one? We just take this symbol, which is denoted like that. We add such symbols in the new alphabet, which is quadratic rise of the alphabet. And therefore, we instead of using two tapes, we use one tape of these 
two layer symbol. So the, the memory can be encoded easily. This is just about the memory. But the problem is with the steam and with the uh, head of the machine, because there is material you could use two heads and we can do uh, um, operations on one side and on the other side for easiness, we could think that these guys are not too many, so they can do this an average three times. But here we have only one head. And these heads, the two heads of the original machine could be in different places. So therefore now the trick is how, how do we keep the information about two heads? How do we keep it? Well, the only way to do it is to keep it on the tape itself. So now, Besides these symbols, we are also going to have symbols like this, A, I, B, and here B, I, A, I, B, I with the Q. And also there could be a situation where both heads are located on the same thing. And now what happens next? Well, what happens next is the following. We have the, our, our old head, and suppose we had an, a move like this, bi, so we had q, we had bi, and we had a transition into q prime, bi prime, and I don't know, right, for example. How do we implement such a transition? Well, now we have to find the place on our tape where this, uh, the I prime is located. And then we um, have to perform this move, right? So how do we find it? Well, this is a tricky problem because we actually don't know where are we located now, to the left or to the right. So this could be coped by uh, modeling the Turing machine with only one-sided tape, which is infinite to one side. Here we do not have this restriction so the thing we could implement is as follows. So we are starting from a point on our tape. We don't know where this Q is located. Could be on the left or on the right. So we make one step to the left. Then we make two steps to the right. And this is all, of course, all this information should be also somehow stored on the tape, just by some markers on these letters. I omit all these things. It's exactly as we did for this previous problem. Then we make uh, three steps to the right, then four steps to the left. This is the search, and this is how we uh, locate this uh, place where Q exists. This or this. After we have located this thing, we perform our step. When we perform our step, and then where we're at now. This is a bit tedious during, due to this uh, zigzag movements. We could support the invariant that both um, uh, Q and P, both heads, are located to the right of our actual head of the u machine. How do we do this? Well, we are, okay, we are, without doing that, we are locate, our big head is located somewhere here. And it should be located on the place where both symbols are blanks and uh, these guys are not there, of course. So this means that if we want to perform this step, we start running our head to the right until we reach the place with Q. So a symbol of this or this form. Then while, when we have reached it, we perform this step. So this means that we replace this symbol with AI B i prime without any q, but maybe with p here. P should not move. And the second symbol is going to be so. Then we move right, change to another specific state, and we could here there was a i plus one, b i plus one, and this should be replaced with added q prime here. So we emulate this movement, right? 
And now, what should we do finally? We should park our head. We should go backwards and put our head here. And this is all done with a specific set of states which operate these, these things. And the real states of the original machine, of the two tape machine, they are kept only on the, on the tape. So uh, our number of states is going to be quite small. It's going to be like, I don't know, seven or something like that for operating on this map. And the real states are kept in the memory. And now the question is about uh, effectivity. So each time we uh, perform a step, we should perform two steps here because we have to replace this and put Q prime here. And also we have to perform two multiplied by S, where S is the number of the symbols which are allocated on the tape of maximum width of both machines, of meaningful symbols like this. And now we uh, can estimate it using the following consideration, that if you have that you, this uh, lemma, that S is always less or equal than T plus the length of the input. Why? Because originally there was this number of cells allocated in memory, right? This is the length of the input. And next, each step of the original Turing machine of the two, two tape Turing machine could allocate no more than one cell, right? So at each step, you could modify only one cell and you could make it from being blank, being meaningful. This yields this inequality. S is as equal as T plus the length of X. So that means that the size of memory you use is actually bounded by the number of steps you take. Right? And this means that the T, the time T1, which is the time of the new machine, which is, uh, which is one tape, is bounded by the following. So it's uh, 2 plus 2 T plus length of X multiplied by t. Why? Because each step of the original Turing machine took this number of steps to emulate it, right? Well, this is quadratic with respect to t in both, in both cases. So because usually t is greater than the length of the input. It is the usual situation because if your running time is less than the, the length of your input, this means that you didn't even read your input. But this is the thing which usually doesn't happen. Because when you do real computation, you first try to digest your input in some way. You have to visit each cell of the input to understand what is the letter residing there. And here you will have this. Uh, so multiplied by t. So this is the major one. So actually, this is something like t squared plus something which is smaller. So this is quadratic lower when we change from a two tape machine to a one tape machine, we have quadratic law. So we keep polynomiality, but the degree of the polynomial gets rise. This, the same, by the way, works for many tape machines. It doesn't matter how many here. Yeah, and the blow up is still quadratic. It's not the number of tapes, it's still quadratic. Okay, so for problem one, let's think about problem one. So it's another, so we have this lemma, which says that uh, this, the uh, number of cells or the zone or the size of memory which is used is bounded by the number of steps. And in number one, we have an opposite thing. If we know a boundary for memory, can we compute a boundary for the number of steps the machine performs? How do we do? So recall that we have provided that the number of steps is finite. And the key to this question is the following. Uh, how do you think? Um, uh, what are the, so suppose we have bounded memory. This means that our, our poss possible number of configurations of our Turing machine is finite, right? 
because otherwise uh, if you are yeah and now if you let's compute the number how many uh, if you have bound in memory uh, how many configurations can a Turing machine have full configuration so what what is included in the configuration uh, no, we have S. So suppose we have S. S is the boundary of the number of cells. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> it's uh, the number of. Yes, I like this. It's the number of elements, uh, a number of. Yeah, but it's not all. Also, we have a state. So this should be multiplied by the number of states. And also we have the third sort of information which we give. This is the position of the head. It's also included in this. And the position of the head gives us X for S. And I claim that this is the boundary for P. Because what happens? If T happens to be greater than this guy, then um, then by pigeonhole principle, you will have two configurations which will repeat in the run time. So suppose we have so if your number of configuration is less than the number of uh, steps your machine performed, then there will be two points of time where we will have the same configuration. But if your, your Turing machine is deterministic, if you reach the same configuration you already visited before, it means that you are just in a loop. You will perform the same computation again and again. And this means that your running time is going to be infinite. And uh, it is exactly what is prohibited in the rules. So this is another lemma, which gives you uh, an upper bound on the running time. Well, but the gap is enormous. So this is linear and this is um, exponential in terms of S. But the corollary of that is as follows. So there is a class of uh, problems decidable on polynomial space. So this means that S is bounded by a polynomial on the plane. Not time, but space. So you have algorithms which run uh, an arbitrary amount of time, but they are bounded in space. They can use only polynomial size of memory. And this means that this class is included in the size of the context of time. This means that uh, the time is bounded exponentially. Well, it's exactly what uh, happens here, that if your space is bounded polynomially, then time is bounded by, well, time is bounded by some exponent of Due to the power of polynomial. If you have polynomial bound for S, you have an exponential bound for S. So, yeah, this is just for you to understand that there is a connection between boundaries on space and uh, time. But uh, so you can see that there's two sorts of resources. So you have a resource of uh, time so how many steps do you take and you have a resource of memory how much memory you use for your computation and these calculations uh, give us the idea of what really happens in the market right now that memory is much cheaper actually exponentially cheaper than the than time so time is valuable memory it costs less and uh, you can use a polynomial time amount of memory and you will have exponential time and this is bad for you time is more important but nevertheless there is a also complexity measurements based on space and also the other inclusion is that the following that uh, uh, p is included into p space just by this level because the size is linearly bounded by the uh, amount of memory. Actually, a more interesting theorem, this is 
well, that's not a theorem, I will prove it now, that NP is also a subset of free space. So any non-deterministic computation can be modeled by a deterministic machine on polynomial space. Well, exactly how to prove this? Well, we just have to implement brute force search. Implementation of brute force search requires exponentially much time, but in memory, it's still polynomial. So it's, I won't give a detailed proof, but this is just for you to understand. Okay, number three, I believe we did that, right? Checking DNF in polynomial time. Well, if not, then please think about this and we'll go further. I think that what we'll do now is the following. We'll try to solve problem five and problem four and six will go for your home thinking, right? So let's do problem five. So for problem five, you will have to prove a theorem here. So a graph has an Euler cycle if and only if it is connected and all vertices of its vertices are even. Well, that means that they are of even degree. So, given this theorem, you can easily solve 5a, right? How do you proceed for 5a if you are given this result? Yeah, we check every vertice for its degree. Well, of course, we remove all these uh, peculiarities about keeping how do we keep the graph in memory. Maybe we keep it as the incident values like that. And then you have to check connectedness, which is a bit more tricky, but you can also do this. How do you check connectedness? How, how can you see it from the matrix? It's not that easy because you see the matrix, how can you understand what's graph connected? In polynomial time. Well, the usual thing you do is what they call depth first search, a DFS, depth first search. For DFS, you do the following you mark an arbitrary vertex, say the first vertex has been visited. So you mark it. Then you uh, find whether there are unmarked vertices. If there are no unmarked vertices, it's a trivial case where the graph has only one vertex and it is marked. In fact, of course. Then you take the uh, neighbors of this vertex, and some of them could be already marked, but you mark all of them. Next, again, you um, they are all visited. If all vertices are visited, you say, OK. If there are some unvisited vertices, then again, you No, no, it's depth. It's depth. Oh, no, it's breadth. It's breadth. Yeah, sorry, it's BFS. This is BFS. Yeah, this is breadth search that you search for. Yeah. And then you just visit, visit the vertices until there are no vertices connected to those which are already visited. So this is layer zero, this is layer one, layer two. And this can get connected. Also, you can do depth first search just by going, taking a vertex and going forward, forward, and forward, until you visit. So these algorithms are polynomial, and you can uh, find the connectedness easy. So now our next task, and it's, you have 5b, and you have this theorem, which we haven't proved yet. So of course, uh, this direction, if a graph has an oil cycle, then it is uh, it satisfies these conditions. This is obvious. We have proved it. But the 
opposite direction is not that easy. Why, if you have a graph which satisfies all of this, why does it have a final center category? How can you find it? And actually, we shall prove this theory by algorithm. Well, not exactly. If you do any sort of these search algorithms, you will sometimes visit some edge twice, possibly. And it won't give you a cycle, it'll give you more of something like a tree. But really, how do you think? Well, the algorithm could be what they call greedy. So what's the greedy algorithm? It's an algorithm which just tries to do the job in the most easy and convenient way. So it just takes the vertex, which is called A, and starts just going to plot the graph. It will return, it will go like this, like this, like this, like this. So all the vertices are even. This means that this algorithm will never fail. It will always have where to go. So how do you think, what is the only possibility for this process to stop? Return to A. So once we return to A, we have built a cycle. So we never use the same edge twice. Since all the vertices are even, we can all, we will always know where to go because for each entrance there is an exit. But once we return to A, we have constructed a cycle and we could have exhausted all the edges here. So if there is other edge exiting here, we could continue our move. But uh, then we return here, suppose the degree is four, then we're done. Uh, is this the solution, how do you think? The question is to find an other cycle. If these are satisfied, visit all vertices. All edges, visit all edges. Edges of graph. Yeah. So, exactly the problem is that we could construct this greedy uh, cycle, but maybe some of the edges got unvisited. There could be some other edges somewhere here which did, didn't get visited by this procedure, right? We're not guaranteed that they will visit. So, now, question for you how to fix that? So we really want to use this greedy algorithm. Well, actually, because we don't know anything else. Yeah, exactly. So the, the trick here is that the graph is connected. Therefore, if there are edges which we didn't visit, that such edge could appear on the adjacent to the cycle. So there could not be another connected component. These edges, which are black, which were not yet visited, they should have somehow interact with this cycle. So exactly I claim that there exists an edge of this form, which is not visited. So if all the edges are visited, we are fine. But if some edges are unvisited edges, then there exists an unvisited edge, which is adjacent to the cycle, to the blue cycle. What do we do next? Yeah, so we call this vertex B and we go, we, we start what they call augmentation of our cycle. So we extend our cycle with a new subcycle. We start with this B and start, so we go along this edge and again, everything is even. So along these edges, we can go, go, go. So at some point, we could return, by the way, to our original cycle. But indeed, here it's also even. So this means that these two and this third one, and then we could go further. So we go further and further. And at some point, what, what can we do? We should return to B, right? This is, again, the only possibility for us to stop. Because everything else is even, we can move forward and explore new edges which we didn't yet visit, neither in the blue nor in the black cycle. But if we return to B, we are done. 
And now the augmentation procedure says that we um, visit both black and uh, uh, blue cycle in a form of the digit eight. So we start with A, we go to B. Instead of returning, we perform this black cycle. So we go like this. We first go like this, then we move, we do, do this black cycle in either direction, it doesn't matter. And then we return to A. So this is the augmented cycle. It looks like infinity or eight. So we start with the original cycle, we go to the second one, return. So this is the augmented cycle. So our cycle became bigger. What happens next? How do you think? Well, again, two, two options. Either we are uh, well, finished, that we have visited all the edges, or we uh, have to visit new edges. There are some unvisited ones. Again, there are new blacks. So they, uh, these are now, now these are blue because they are in our main cycle. But there could be new blacks. So a new black could be somewhere here. And again, this is the vertex C. And we have to perform augmentation. Since the graph is finite, it could be a graph, it could be a multigraph, it doesn't matter here. Since the graph or multigraph is finite, uh, then uh, the augmentation process will always uh, finish in a finite number of steps. So uh, the connectedness is crucial here because this guarantees us that there is not only just a black edge, an unvisited edge somewhere. This black edge uh, should there should exist a black edge which is connected to the original blue cycle. So this is only by uh, connectedness. So what is left and what you could easily do at home? Well, this is just an easy exercise in calculation that this algorithm is polynomial. Just take polynomial number. Well, it's intuitively it's easy, but you have to do some calculation. So how many steps do you need? Well, why I why I say that this is trivial that option because we don't see any sort of brute force statement here. Everything is done like in a normal algorithmic thing. So we didn't try to enumerate a large number of things and find something out. It's just going forward, forward, and forward. But well, the clue is that you have to just make an invariant, like uh, each edge is visited exactly once and for each edge for working on this we have to spend say, a constant number of time or a quadratic number of times like so this is it will be really polynomial and this finishes uh number five a so we've proved the theorem and also this finishes number five b that if we uh check this criteria then we can just implement this algorithm in polynomial time it will check uh, it will find out, out one uh, Euler cycle. Also a question for you just to think about, could there be a graph with an exponential number of Euler cycles? For example, if we have a two, two CNF, it's polynomially decidable whether it is satisfiable, but you cannot write a polynomial algorithm for writing down all the satisfying assignments because it could be an exponential number of the same question for Euler cycles. Now we have uh, proved that uh, there is an algorithm for polynomially decidable where the Euler cycle exists. There is an algorithm which yields one cycle, just arbitrary cycle. But uh, could there be an exponential number of cycles in the graph? Euler cycle. The number of cycles depends on the degree of vertices. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying the number of vertices. Exponential number of first or the number of edges. It's the same because the number of edges is roughly speaking no more than quadratic in number. So, well, the clue is that you have to construct some like chain like graph, and in the chain like graph, you have to have two possibilities. In each chain, you have to have two possibilities for, uh, for the cycle to go. Okay, so. Um, Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. This is the end of our seminar class. Goodbye.